Hello everyone, this is Christian Stemp, Hygiene Advisor to the Davenage Group. It's a real pleasure to participate uh, remotely to your seminar. Who am I? I'm within the European dental industry for almost 30 years. I'm also a member of the European Technical Committee for Standardization, participating to two working groups. Working Group 5, which regards steam sterilizers, and Working Group 8, which concerns a thermal washer disinfector. My biggest activity is to provide lectures uh, to healthcare professionals on infection prevention, reprocessing and sterilization. Also comprehensive courses into the detail for dental assistant. This would take three to four hours. I also design reprocessing areas um, I can support you in improving or designing, redesigning your reprocessing area. Now the agenda uh, for this one hour, I thought I would share with you some experience on environmental contamination and therefore prevention of airborne infections, protection of personal face masks, type of face mask, how to best use them, then the main topic is going to be reprocessing uh, dental instruments and in the end I will show you some examples of uh, let's say ideal reprocessing areas. I will first briefly touch on microbiology just that we are all on the same page starting with bacteria. Bacteria they will replicate at a very high speed which means between 20 to 30 minutes, given good conditions, which is heat and moisture. So bacteria will replicate, it will grow to a fixed size and then start dividing into two daughter cells. What we see here inside, this is the genetic material, the genes of the bacteria. And obviously from the mother cell, you will get two identical copies uh, within 20 to 30 minutes. So we understand this is very fast. After half an hour, then we have two. After one hour, we have four, eight, 16. It grows at a very high exponential speed, basically overnight. And this is a very good reason for treating your instruments uh, after the last patient in the evening and not wait for the other day, because within one night, within 12 hours, it will grow to 17 millions. Now viruses, to the contrary of bacteria, which are mainly good for us, good for humans, viruses are born to kill. There's no good virus, actually virus comes from the Latin poison. They are all poisonous. We recognize two types of, two families of viruses. You have the enveloped viruses and the non-enveloped viruses. They also have their DNA or RNA, the genes here within the virus, which is surrounded by a protein coat that protects these genes. And for the enveloped viruses, you have this external layer, it's a lipidic uh, layer to protect this uh, protein coat. And this external layer will also facilitate penetration into a host cell. Yes, because um, viruses, they cannot replicate by themselves. We can see it in a minute. What concerns these enveloped viruses, here you can find the worst viruses available, HIV, Hepatitis B, C, and D, the Ebola virus, and obviously the uh, COVID coronavirus, which is here. These are the worst. As I said before, to replicate a virus needs a host cell. It can be a bacteria, a human cell, and you can see here uh, the size is extremely small. It's actually 10 times smaller than a bacteria. Now, what is a micron? This is a thousandth of a millimeter. You take one millimeter, you cut into thousand pieces. This is the size of one micron. Keep this in mind. I'm going to use it a bit later. And as you can see, a virus is even 10 times, 100 times smaller than a thousandth of a millimeter. Unbelievable. Now, replication. A virus cannot replicate by, by themselves. They need a host cell, as I mentioned before. This is our virus, envelope virus, coronavirus, actually. And this virus is going to target a host cell. 
Here it is. It will attach to the host cell, thanks to the corona, penetrate inside the host cell, and use the metabolism of the host cell to replicate. It will unquote, copy and paste, and assemble again. So these newly born viruses are going to target a neighbor cell. So this host cell is infected. It's actually sometimes very disturbed or not to say dead. And some cancer will start with such disturbed cells. The good news about this is that uh, these envelope viruses are the weakest. On this scale of resistance, at first, the more fragile are the enveloped viruses. On top of them, we have the vegetative bacteria, fungi and yeast, and the non-enveloped viruses. On top of that, that's going to be serious, we talk about multi-resistant bacteria, like the tuberculosis uh, mycobacterium. On top of them, the most resistant are the uh, spoliated bacteria. When we talk about this infection, we recognize three levels of uh, performance. You have a low level, <coughs> sorry, which includes these three families. Then we have intermediate level of uh, disinfection. This, I'm come back to this when we talk about pre-disinfection of dental instruments. And Basically, uh, we call this sometimes cold sterilization, which is the high level disinfection, which includes all these families. Now, where can we find the uh, microorganisms when we talk about environmental contamination? This is the number of microorganisms within one cubic meter of air. So, when you go to a shopping mall, and ladies, shopping is very dangerous. <laughs> we talk about 4 million in one cubic meter of air, the air that we breathe. The more people, the higher the contamination. Outside, on the street, which is a nice place, it's below 100,000 per cubic meter. Of course, it depends if it's crowded or not. But the best place, the safest place to go for jogging, practicing sport is on the beach, in the forest, far away from cities. Then we are down to 50 microorganisms per cubic meter. In the dental practice, I'm coming back to this in a minute, we talk about 1,500 on average. This is a study from England. It is like it compares to two or three people chatting in a room. This is the average contamination. I mentioned people, um, believe it or not, but every single person relieves this per minute from 100 to 5,000 microorganisms. How come? This comes from basically um, nasopharyngeal droplets. Okay, when we breathe, when we sneeze, when we sneeze, we expose 40,000 droplets. When we cough, it's like thousands. Um, then you have also hair, skin, nails. Actually, we release these are particles, which you see here, depending if you are resting or if you are you know excited busy you raise more and more particles per minute and these particles contain germs this being said um last uh, month in last october and last or in last march april um, i um, run a webinar and uh, regarding masks specific on masks and i want to share this with you this is a video um, which I found from the uh, Japanese uh, television, NHK, and they had a camera. This camera will capture droplets, obviously, and also particles, aerosols. When we talk about aerosol, these are particles below 50, 50 micron. Above 50, we call these uh, droplets uh, splatters. Okay, so this camera will capture, this is a droplet, you see this big size droplet which is expulsed by this guy sneezing, but then you have smaller ones, and this is the purpose of this video, to show that you have small aerosols 
which will not drop immediately. They will travel. They will be like suspended in the air and then settle after a while. The smaller the size, the longer it will, let's say, fly around the, the area. Now this is sneezing. The same program showed two guys chatting in a room. See the distance, uh, when we have to respect some distance, now you understand why. Here we have two guys chatting. The Japanese speak loud, and when we chat, okay, we also release uh, droplets, bigger ones, but also aerosol. Again, this is what I want to show you. You see here all these small dots. And we breathe and inhale parts of this aerosol. This is how people get infected. This is now a room. This guy sneezes. On the left-hand side, we see the timing, minutes. And within 10, 15 minutes, everybody here is inhaling this contaminated air. Now imagine in a shopping mall or in a stadium or a, any place where there are a lot of people, we inhale these uh, microorganisms. Now you understand much better why this COVID-19 has spread over the world and so quickly. Unbelievable. This shows that the smaller the size, uh, the faster, the, the longer it will be suspended in the air and it can reach distances like 100 meters. Another study from, from England, which has uh, measured the contamination at a distance of, let's say, two meters from the patient's mouth, and directly here on the patient's mouth. These are agar plates, which will measure colonies. Here we talk about 1,500 colonies of microorganisms before treatment. And during treatment, especially drilling, scaling, it goes up to 6,000, so four times higher. And here we talk about the distance of two meters. Now we measure close to the patient's mouth. This is uh, featuring streptococci. Streptococci prove that this contamination is, comes out from the patient's mouth. After treatment, like the video before, it will settle and then second treatment, third treatment. This video uh, even talks about six times up to 20 times. You see, when you work with the turbine, the turbine will pressurize the patient's mouth. In the mouth, there are on average 10 billion microorganisms. And when you spray like this, this is spread all over the place. Watch the mask here. <laughs> see, drilling, scaling, and obviously, what is around the place, around the unit, is heavily contaminated. Here, we try to compare uh, the difference in aerosol emission between a turbine and a contraangle. You know, a turbine is air-driven, a contraangle is uh, motor-driven. But still, both heads are pressurized we also have to include the spray, air and water, coming out from the, from the turbine's head. Now this compares both emissions. This is the handpiece, followed by the turbine. You can hardly see the, the difference. Uh, this is why we have put them on top. Bear in mind that the turbine will rotate at a much higher speed than the red tagged contraangle. Now watch here. How can we solve that with a very efficient suction? With suction without suction. You can also see here that um, a head is never 100% tight, and there's always air coming out from the push button, from the chuck. And obviously, if you buy a high-end uh, turbine like this one, uh, it's better designed, more accurate, more precise, and releases less air emission. This is a list of the so-called airborne diseases, infections, COVID-19, tuberculosis, flu and colds 
etc. What is the uh, defense to that? Masks. Now, I just want to clarify the difference between surgical masks and FFP masks. Surgical masks, it's a one direction protection. They will only protect the person in front of you, your patients, but not the wear yourselves. You are not protected to particles, droplets above 5 micron. And when we talk about droplets, we talk about the 1R and 2R. These are four types of masks and uh, the 2R will protect, will have a filtration of 98% of particles uh, above 5 micron, but it will not filter aerosols below 5 micron. The one offers only a 95% uh, protection. So in any case, if you buy a surgical mask, buy the 2R, 98, minimum 98% filtration. But again, because of this uh, low filtration efficiency and the um, uh, loose fit, it doesn't offer a very nice protection. And I know now many doctors who switch from uh, surgical masks to FFP masks. Why? Because FFP, they offer a much higher protection. So in Europe, we call it um, FFP uh, N95, for example, here, N95. In the US, they call it US N95, or in China, it's KN95. Uh, this equals the FFP2. Here we have a filtration of 94%, but US95, KN95, they offer 95% filtration. This is a minimum filtration. A mask can offer even uh, higher filtration. And then we talk about filtration above 0 0.3 micron. If you remember, a face mask, surgical mask, will protect, will filter 5 micron. This goes down to 0 0.3 micron. And the FFP3 uh, offers filtration of 99%. Okay, so much higher than uh, the FFP2. FFP1 is around 80%, so we forget about FFP2. You should choose between FFP2 or FFP3. In the US, they call it N100, which features 99.97%. As you have noticed, some masks offer an exhaling valve. Uh, obviously, this facilitates breathing, but it will not filter the air that you expire. So I would not recommend to use uh, such masks. So basically, it's uh, FFP2 or FFP3. Now, my question is, you see here, we talk about particles above 0 0.3 micron. But a virus has a smaller size. This is 0 0.3 micron. This is the size of a virus. Okay, and a virus could, <laughs> uh, let's say, uh, fly through this um, net. If you talk about a fish net, bigger fish will be caught and smaller fish will travel through the through the, uh, the net so how can this work how can a mask filter something that is smaller than 0 0.3 this was a very interesting research and a nice result actually 0 0.3 micron is the hardest size to capture why because above 0 0.3 micron particles will travel let's say in a straight direction or a small curve Below 0.3, the particles are so small that they are bounced around, you know, in the area of gases, you have uh, different movements, and these particles are um, uh, zigzagging, zigzagging, so they will not go straight. So how does it work with our masks? This is a surgical mask with three layers, and this is the FFP mask. You can see there are five to seven um, layers. So this um, 
small sizes, they will zigzag within the mask and they will be caught, um, they will be intercepted within these uh, different layers. Smaller size go straight, they will be caught directly here, and smaller ones zigzagging inside the mask will be captured within the layers. Now I just let you imagine, uh, here we have at least three layers, this is why it's not so efficient. Now imagine uh, normal masks that we see on the market uh, with uh, cotton or tissue. I let you imagine how much this filters. Again, many doctors uh, move from surgical to FFP mask because they offer really a nice and efficient protection. Look, this graph shows you the filtration efficiency of different masks and you see that all masks filter much better above 0.3 or 0.1 and again much better below 0.3.1 so the hardest particle to filter is around 0.3 now you understand when we talk about HEPA filters uh, when we talk about uh, back bacterial filter which we see on the autoclave it is 0.3 micro good um, how to properly uh, fit a mask obviously you will disinfect your hands before you grab your mask be careful and do not touch the filtration surface the front of the mask but grab the mask with the uh, strips put them properly as shown on this picture and very often we see masks which are not properly fit obviously surgical mask and you know, air will flow through the um, easiest way. So here, this lady will inhale non-filtered air. Obviously, put your mask on your nose, because if you breathe in, even if you breathe with your mouth, there's still 5 to 10% which will enter through your nose. So please put the mask, cover your nose, cover your mouth when you breathe. Now the mask. Uh, when you have FFP masks, you may really check the proper fitting of the mask if it's really tight. So you breathe in very strongly and you can see that here the mask will be uh, sucked in into it. This shows that it is fit properly. Please first you should check, this is just information, but this is the, um, the time you can wear a mask until you have to change it. It's like three hours uh, for uh, surgical masks and uh, six, eight, whatever hours. This is given by the manufacturer. Eight hours in continuous use. Whenever you interrupt, you touch your mask, you have to replace your masks. An interruption, if you touch it, if you put it on your neck, as you can see very often, here, this is now, or has ever always been forbidden, but now you understand better that you have to replace your mask. Don't forget to protect your eyes. Normal glasses do not offer a nice protection, so wear goggles or face masks. Just a brief information about airborne, uh, sorry, about bloodborne infections, hepatitis B, C, D. I need to finish with the hand hygiene. You know, hands are responsible for more than 50% of the infections. So between patients, you remove your gloves. And after having removed your gloves, <clears throat> you need to disinfect your hands. Very often people go and wash their hands. There's a difference between washing with soap and disinfecting with a hydroalcoholic solution. You have worn your gloves for half an hour, one hour, so inside your gloves you have grown microorganisms. We have to reduce the microbial population on your hands. Therefore, we disinfect our hands with a hydroalcoholic solution. Ask yourselves, are my hands dirty? No. So why should I wash my hands? So disinfect your hands and wash only if they are dirty. Obviously, after the toilets in the morning, you have to wash your hands. Followed, after sorrow drying, you would also disinfect your hands. Do not wash and disinfect immediately because, number one, you are going to dissolve your solution, which is going to be less efficient, and it can lead also to some allergy. So you wash, you dry your hands, 
and you disinfect your hands. This is the right way to do this. Now let's come to the main topic, reprocessing medical devices. Reprocessing means uh, follow specific steps to render used instruments to reuse. To illustrate the different steps, I took this reprocessing area, you recognize a uh, so-called dirty area and a clean zone, clean area. Ideal would be to have one door and a second door because this is the uh, one way reprocessing steps. You, do, you don't watch backwards, you go ahead, you go forward. It starts with the um, eliminate the residues, and then you have first step pre disinfection, so called soaking. You have different sizes and different types of uh, soaking bath. Then you rinse your instruments, you wash. Here I put the ultrasonic cleaner. You rinse, you can see, you don't go back, you go forward. A second sink is required for this rinsing. Then we dry the instruments. We package the instruments, sterilize, and store or reuse the instruments. Now I want to describe all these phases. Number one, pre-disinfection. Here I will not. I'm not talking about uh, hand pieces because you cannot obviously soak, emerge dental hand pieces. But you can put all the other instruments. You soak them into this disinfectant solution. This is very urgent. You have to do it immediately, the soon as possible, after use, after treatment. Okay, why is it so urgent? Because you have to prevent debris, saliva, blood from drying. And second, we talked about disinfectant. We not only stop the growth of the microorganisms, but we start eliminating, killing microorganisms and therefore reducing the microbial population, the microbial contamination of the load of the instruments. And there's a very good reason for that, <laughs> because you protect yourselves. Because afterwards you are going to manipulate the instruments, dismantle, wash, whatsoever, and you have a risk of uh, injury and the risk of infection. Having done this properly, you can reduce drastically the risk of infection. For me, this is the most important, the crucial first step of the oil reprocessing circle. The solution, the temperature should not exceed 40 to 45 degrees Celsius, because above that, um, this will fix blood proteins and make the instruments extremely difficult to, to clean afterwards. What is the purpose here, the target we talked before about the intermediate disinfection. This is what you want to achieve. See how safe it can be afterwards? However, to reach this goal, you have to buy the appropriate solution. The solution to mix with water, but you have to use it properly. What is the, like, this is the uh, technical table, the specs of this uh, liquid. You want to target viruses bacteria and multi-resistant bacteria. You can see here different uh, combinations of concentration and contact time. For example, if we choose 3% 15 minutes, this is okay for viruses because I see 1% 15. Here we talk about 3%, so I'm sure that uh, it's much faster to inactivate viruses. It's okay for vegetative bacteria, but here I have a problem with multi-resistant bacteria. This combination, 3%-15, is not going to be efficient on multi-resistant bacteria. Solution, you either go to 30 minutes, or you go one step beyond, you spend a little bit more, you go from 3 to 4%, but it takes 15 minutes to achieve the intermediate disinfection. If you make any mistake here, if you don't buy the right product, you will not uh, achieve the goal and compromise your safety and compromise sterilization. It is very important to understand that uh, along this trip here, we will step by step reduce the microbial contamination and make it quite easy, between brackets, uh, for the sterilizer to kill the uh, residual germs. If not, 
uh, you will not uh, reach the target. Obviously, you have to rinse properly to remove any residue of chemicals. Uh, this is very nicely done with tap water, hard water. And then we switch to cleaning. Cleaning, to me, this is the most challenging, the most difficult uh, step. I know many guidelines you can see that uh, uh, only clean instruments can be sterile. If you don't do this properly, you will certainly compromise sterilization. You cannot process dirty instruments because the dirt, the residue, uh, the debris, they will prevent steam to contact the surface of the instrument and properly kill microorganisms. It's an obstacle to sterilization. Here we use detergent, okay, and uh, someone has to provide the mechanical action. We can either clean manually, as this picture shows, you can use a ultrasonic cleaner or thermal washer disinfector. Manual cleaning, this is quite uh, dangerous because you're going to brush the instruments, so you recreate this aerosol, this contaminated air which you breathe in, so you expose yourselves at risk unless you wear and here i would really recommend ffp mask this is a must to me plus a face shield cover your hair use a gown and very important you're going to wear heavy duty gloves some gloves are even stitch proof use soft brushes this prevents you to scratch the instruments you know microscopic scratches will allow bacteria to colonize on the surface of the instrument. The smoother, the better. This is quite a dangerous operation and uh, it's not reproducible. From Monday to Friday, you're not going to brush the same way. So it's really left in the hands and the experience of the operator. I really recommend to use, before an eventual manual cleaning, to use ultrasonic cleaners. They're fully automatic, you press the button and uh, it will work. You see, this is a cut of ultrasonic cleaner. How does it work? You have these transducers which are attached or welded onto the bottom of the chamber, a stainless steel chamber, and then we'll provide a succession of compression and decompression. And you will see here small bubbles appearing. Uh, these bubbles are going to implode after compression they appear during decompression and when the liquid is compressed it will implode so this implosion will provide a huge energy a huge power to clean instruments it's very nice because uh, it will not scratch the instrument it will nicely clean uh, rough surfaces it's very nice for burrs diamond burrs Rather than manual clean diamond burrs, you can use uh, ultrasonic cleaners. It's very efficient and uh, powerful. More powerful are thermal washers. These machines, obviously, they, they offer the best solution. They're quite expensive, but if you think about it, this machine does everything. It will pre-wash, rinse, wash, and tear on the cake. It will also disinfect. The last rinse is run with very hot water. These machines are sold uh, naked, basically without accessory, and depending on uh, your organization, the number of instruments, uh, the sales force is a, will be able to supply the right accessories. To illustrate the, the power of cleaning of these three methods, I saw this very, very nice um, study from the Bridgen. British Dental Journal, and this is how you would validate the cleaning process, how you check the performance of the cleaning process. You want to measure how much is left on the instruments. This is the residual protein level left on the instruments. This is present after use, 462 micrograms. After manual cleaning, it's on average down to 78 micrograms of proteins left on these forceps. Ultrasonic plus manual is down to 39, and the washer, that's what I said, is the best, the most powerful cleaning. It's the future. I think in 10, 20 years, every dental clinic will be equipped with a washer. After 
washing you will rinse and dry and after you will package the instruments you can use self-sealing pouches that's okay for me but i will ask you to do one test you fill the pouch with water like one third you fold and glue the you seal the pouch and you put it upside down if if water comes out here it means this pouch is either not okay or not folded properly as indicated by the manufacturer so check this with the manufacturer of your uh, the supplier of your pouches when you prepare the, the pouch um, the pouch the size should be like 20-30% uh, larger than the instruments uh, you should not, like it's shown here, you should not uh, put too many pouches together. Actually, you should avoid overlapping of pouches. In other words, also when it comes to questions, shall I put the paper, paper down? Please read instructions for use because the manufacturer of the autoclave has tested the machine, especially the drying phase, which is critical for pouches, and the manufacturer shall tell you how to prepare your trays. It's typically paper up, you know, and B-type sterilizer, but um, it can be different from one manufacturer to the other. It depends really on the technology of the of the autoclave. Now we come to sterilization, the last step before storage. And here there is no choice. The autoclave has to kill to remove all surviving microorganisms. Still, uh, the European standard says that uh, you can talk about or calculate about probability, it's never going to be zero. This is why we have this SIAL, Sterilization Assurance Level of 10 to minus 6. To make it very simple, if there is 1 million microorganisms left on your load, one is allowed to survive, one in a million. Now this depends, it's never going to be zero, it's kind of frustrating, but it's just the same case in hospitals. The better you run all these steps, starting from pre-disinfection, this is like 10 to minus 5, 5 log reduction, cleaning is 2 to 3 log, and sterilization is 6 log. So if we start with a very high here contamination, when we start here after treatment, 5 log after disinfection, plus 2 log after cleaning, and here 6 log. This is the target, 1 in a million, a set of 10 to minus 6. So the better we run all these steps, the closer to zero. Now sterilization. Okay, we have different type of technologies. Uh, this reminds your me your steam cooker. But this is what we used to sell, uh, see on the market in the early 90s, and since 2004, the European norm on small steam sterilizers was published. <clears throat> So how does this compare? It's a bit technical, but you have to really understand this very important feature. The very first step of a steam sterilization cycle is the air removal. We have to remove air to allow steam to penetrate inside the chamber, and of course inside pouches and inside very challenging instruments. We call these hollow instruments. How does it work with this machine? It's like your steam cooker, you put water inside the chamber, you close the lid and you start heating the cooker. Steam will fill the chamber from the top to the bottom and drain air through that pipe. The issue is you might have air bubbles trapped inside these uh, hollow instruments. If you talk about pouches or textile, the same can happen. Okay, the machine will fill the chamber with steam and from place to place you're going to have such air pockets trapped and obviously inside these air pockets we will not reach the critical parameters, we don't reach the right temperature, steam saturation for a certain time. So we miss, you know, temperature, we miss moisture, heat, power. This is the profile of such uh, cycles pre-vacuum, let's say, sterilization process, plateau, and dry. This is now the cycle called B-type cycle. B comes from big sterilizer, in other words, the medical grade cycle, hospital grade sterilization, which is offered on these small benchtop sterilizers. 
how does this pre-vacuum work? It's a bit different from the other technique because these machines are equipped with vacuum pumps. How does it work? You will see a video appearing here, but the machine will run successive vacuum and pressure pulses uh, to remove the air uh, to a very low level inside the chamber. When we start the cycle here, you agree with uh, that we have 100% air inside the chamber and 0% steam. As I mentioned the machine now, the pump is going to pump out air directly from the chamber. But one vacuum pulse, it's purely theoretical, will only remove 90%, not 100%, but only 90 So after one vacuum pulse here, we have removed 90% of air, so we have 10% left, and after steam injection here, 90% steam. It's not enough. The machine runs a second 90% vacuum of 10, so we are down to 1% vacuum, and therefore 99% steam. This is the vacuum pulse. You see the pouch is expanding. Pressure pulse, so we go back to atmospheric pressure. And then the machine runs another 90% pulse of 1, so we are down to 0 0.1 and 99.9, .9, almost 100% steam within the chamber and very important inside the most challenging packages and instruments then the machine uh, goes to a higher pressure to reach the plateau this is the pr and after the suggestion process the machine dries so the vacuum pump is also used to dry this offers a much faster drawing than machines without pumps. Um, and here the cycle is completed. So when we talk about the sterilization cycle, it's from dry to dry. It has to dry with closed door. So we've seen the uh, steam cooker cycle, <laughs> uh, which is called N-type. We have now to make sure that whichever cycle you're going to use, it is compatible with the, these families of uh, instruments, load types. Obviously, such a machine with a very weak vacuum or a lot of air left inside, 3 to 5%, it's only compatible with full solid instruments. No cavity, no lumen. So this is going to be enough for this uh, type of machine. However, there is S-type cycles. You see here that the manufacturer will design specific cycles. S stands for specific. Specific cycles for specific instruments. So the operator has a challenge, has to understand for which type of instruments this cycle is designed for. In other words, if you use the B-type cycle, B is compatible with any load type either single pouch or wrapped or double pouch or wrapped. This is the medical grade cycle. So if you have to choose, if you have to drive your assistant, uh, I would recommend to use a B-type cycle. Full stop. In my country, in France, this is mandatory, only B-type cycles. Why? Because again, the other cycles, they are faster. Okay, this is nice, but how is it made? One pulse less, two pulse less. Okay, so this, this type of profile, this type of cycle, will never uh, pass this uh, process challenge device called Helix. How can I make it even faster? I shorten the drying cycle, here and here. So it's a very fast cycle, but this cycle cannot be called the suggestion cycle because, of course, you cannot process pouch instruments, there will be water inside the lumen, and uh, as you know, wet pouches or wet loads are not accepted as sterile. The paper must be absolutely dry when you open the door of the autoclave. There might be not droplets like here, but some fog, you know, some condensation on the plastic side, but this will disappear within a few minutes. Otherwise, here, what shall be done? Not restart the cycle because you make it worse and worse. But you open the pouch, you dry the instrument, and you go back to pre-disinfection, back to start.
if everything is okay, uh, then you can store the instruments, obviously, preferably in drawers and well-maintained cabinets. Now, storage time, this depends from country to country. It goes from three to six months, six months for double pouched instruments. But this you have to check locally in Bulgaria, uh, according to your local guidelines. As I mentioned before, all what I talked about does not concern um, hand pieces because hand pieces are special. Obviously, you are supposed to sterilize your hand pieces to process your hand pieces between patients. Look at this. These instruments are quite complex. You have many small pipes and tubes. This is for the drive air. You have the cooling air, cooling water, and contrangles or hand pieces are even more complicated, to, especially to clean. To sterilize, a B-type cycle will easily and efficiently process instruments like hand pieces. But how can we clean uh, the inside of the instrument? This is now the, uh, the question, and uh, there is really some limitations. And what we see in our workshop, we see all the damage uh, on your hand pieces. A technician you know, can easily tell you if you have lubricated enough, you have cleaned enough, he can really coach you, help you uh, improving your maintenance. This shows a well-maintained turbine and a lack of maintenance, especially lack of cleaning here. You want to see more, this is an air motor, this is a straight surgical hand piece. You know, after one surgery, there is around 1,000 colonies of microorganisms inside a handpiece, a single handpiece. Limitations. I mentioned to you it's different, obviously, because you cannot soak handpieces inside the uh, infection solution, and you cannot use an ultrasonic cleaner, which is a pity, to clean the inside of the instrument. Now, I cannot talk on... Uh, behalf of all manufacturer, this is a standard. Be aware that the manufacturer must is obliged, according to the ISO internal standard, must guide you, must provide you the instructions for use how to reprocess hand pieces. It might be that one tells you you can soak them, you can use this, but really refer to the instructions. Of it. It's very very important. But as far as I know, most of the the biggest players agree in saying no soaking, no ultrasonic cleaning. So then what? How can we, you know, process our instruments? Uh, it starts here with the... Um, okay, you remove the burr, you can uh, run at low speed to flush and rinse the instruments, disconnect the instruments, and what you would do, you would, of course, pre-disinfect. This is the purpose of the first step to remove, to reduce the microbial population and to keep the instruments moist. This is mainly done by uh, pre-soaked wipes. But here, you notice that you do not disinfect and keep the inside moist. This is the first limitation of uh, hand pieces. Okay, some of them are dismantable, especially, especially surgical instruments are dismantable. You can take them apart and properly disinfect and rinse, there's no issue with that. But most of them are not dismantable. Therefore, how can we clean inside without using an ultrasonic cleaner? Very often, then the assistant tells me, oh, I use the uh, oil can. Hang on, I mean, even this can says superior cleaning and lubrication. But sorry, when I wash my dishes at home, I don't use oil, I use a dishwashing soap. I'm not saying you should use this for hand pieces, it's just the picture. Cleaning equals detergent. And here is a detergent spray. This spray allows you to clean the inside. You have to let it work for half an hour, contact time, and then there's a second can with compressed air to remove the excess of detergent and debris. So this might be the only way to uh, clean the inside of the instrument, but no way you can use oil. Oil doesn't clean. Rinse and dry. Nice to have is um, a low pressure air. You can use uh, compressed air at low pressure. Filtered air, preferably. 
to remove all what droplets residues uh, from the inside of the instrument. Outside, you take uh, a non-woven tissue, single-use tissue, to dry the external parts. Lubrication. That's also one more step. Lubricate between patients. If you sterilize between patients, which is the, the purpose, the, the target, you must lubricate every time before you package and you sterilize, every time. When we talk about lubrication, it's just a one second small shot, a very small quantity of oil, too much, don't put too much oil. This shows that you should rather do it, if you do not sterilize between patients, you shouldn't do it between patients, but do it like after every half an hour of use. I'm talking at the high speed, okay, hand pieces, contrangles, turbines. By doing half an hour, you have the optimum longevity of your handpiece. The more often you do it, the higher the longevity. Obviously, it's not, uh, it would be too much to do it after five minutes, but on average, we recommend to do it every half an hour of use or every second, third patient. For the uh, low speed, like surgery, you can do it once a day. Then you package, you sterilize, you store. Is the manual reprocessing okay? Yes and no. If you remember, only clean instruments can be sterile. So you really have to focus and concentrate on internal cleaning. Therefore, there are machines on the market, many machines. And uh, what you want to know, maybe not from the sales rep, but from the manufacturer, is what does the machine offer? Does it clean inside? clean outside, lubricate, this is what you want to know. And then you can work around a solution. Obviously, the best cleaning is provided by your washer. This washer has a specific adapters, which allows the detergent to flow inside and also outside the instrument. So this is the best solution. It does clean inside, outside. It does not lubricate, so I would really combine it uh, with this machine that lubricates one handpiece within 10 seconds. It has two compartments and you can basically one after the other switch from left to right every 10 seconds it provides you a perfectly lubricated instrument. After this you pouch and you sterilize. This is to me the best solution. To finish our presentation I talked, uh, I mentioned that I will talk about uh, reprocessing areas. Uh, you might not like this one like I do, <laughs> this is a dental university. It was 10 years ago, I hope in the meantime they improved. You know, I travel a lot and I get pictures a lot and uh, I can't believe it. This is in my country in France. Look at this, this was a service technician who serviced a steam sterilizer and this was installed <laughs> in the toilet room, can you imagine? Then you can find some place where you see coffee cups, microwaves. No, this is a reprocessing area. I don't want coffee machines inside reprocessing areas. You want more? Look at this. This doctor has reused, single-use, disposable instruments, which have not soaked properly into this mozzarella tank, you know. So this is absolutely ridiculous, scandalous, like this sponge here. And look at the shape of the... Uh, the maintenance of the sink, look at here, look at the um, bench. This is meant to be like a soaking bath. It's more storage. They use paper tissue. This is absolutely not recommended. And I can see some coffee cups here. This is extremely dangerous. Okay, let's be serious. Uh, <clears throat> this was the first I showed you in the beginning. Um, I want to mention that um, the airflow ventilation shell travel from the clean area towards the dirty area, not the opposite way. Remember, if you brush manually here, you have a aerosol which you don't want to travel to the clean area. For the rest, soaking, rinsing, cleaning, rinsing, drying, packaging, sausage. This is the right workflow. Ideal will be with entrance here, exit here. I know it's not always possible to have two doors, but then what you can do, 
this is the example here this is a big big clinic very close to my home uh, seven doctors seven autoclaves seven assistants it's a big big clinic so they soak by the chair it was quite far from a few 10 15 meters from the chair to the reprocessing area and the doctors want the assistant to soak by the chair then they will go and bring these soaked uh, instruments to this reprocessing area. There's a window here, a pass-through window. They will be rinsed here, cleaned with two big ultrasonic cleaners, rinsed again, dried. This is a drying machine which I found in, in France. Then we go here to the pouching and one autoclave per doctor. Every machine runs like 10 cycles per day. Once the cycle is completed, all the trays are put below the bench and the assistant comes from the outside and there is no one that uh, comes inside here it's a restricted area this is what reprocessing areas are one step beyond a bit quicker is the use here of a washer we have pre-infection rinsing and then the underbench washer. This washer saves you space on the bench. On top of the bench, you may put a small ultrasonic cleaner, which is nice for burrs. You know, some people do a pre-washing in the ultrasonic cleaner, and then they buy the specific accessory to wash burrs inside the washer. On top, I put my lubricating machine, and then we go to, again, pouching and sterilization. You will note here that uh, when I design a reprocessing area, I always uh, ask for compressed air and uh, for demineralized water for maybe rinsing and without uh, hard water. Again, here compressed air to complete drying. Some washers they would not dry, you know, perfectly. You still have to wipe off the instruments and uh, use compressed air. So therefore, it's basics. You no know, higher, it the more it costs, the better the machine dries. And here, once the instruments are labeled, you have a um, pass-through furniture, first in, first out, which allows you not to go back to the dirty area, but to place them into this uh, storage area, and then the assistant takes them from the outside. So we do these kind of things. Uh, this was a doctor in France who asked me to you know, provide, me, provide him guidance on how to organize a reprocessing area. This is a brand new uh, surgery. And um, obviously I just asked him which kind of machines he's gonna use. And in this case, he's told me a washer and two sterilizers and so on. So I designed, let's say the best, it's not my money, so I <laughs> spent his money, but then they would do or not do what I, what I offer. And this doctor did exactly what I designed. I'm talking about automated glass sliding doors see the rinsing area the uh, washer the machine for the hand pieces and then behind the glass wall the um, pouching device and two steam sterilizers and again sliding doors so they would not touch the surface uh, of the door and this you know this is just right behind reception so every single patient is gonna see inside the reprocessing area. Sometimes they ask some questions, they're surprised and pleased to see that the doctor cares about patients. That's something you have to think about. This is another case in Dubai. A doctor wanted uh, the best. So again, I said, look, you have to put a glass, so show your patients that you care. Again, here we see a sliding door, we see a ultrasonic cleaner, a washer, a machine for um, here it is a machine for hand pieces, the pouching device, a sterilizer, and pass through double door cabinets. So they would store the instruments here. And what you see here, this is the um, let's say hand hygiene station where they wash their hands, disinfect their hands, and wear gloves. Small detail, but the airflow goes from the dirty clean area towards the dirty area. This is the end of my presentation. You see here we have my email address. If you have some questions, you can post them here or any advice or recommendation. It would be a pleasure. 
Therefore, thank you very much for having me and I wish you uh, a very nice seminar and uh, hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye.